Damien Rowland's probably well known to all of you as one of the organisers and, and key players in Don't Forget the Bubbles. He's an emergency, an academic emergency physician at Leicester in the UK, and he's also the chair of Peruki, which I'm sure he'll tell you about today, which is the Paediatric Emergency Research Network of the UK and Ireland. Thank you. So, good morning. Thank you very much for coming. This is a painting by Luke Fields. It was painted in 1891. Luke lost his son at a year of age um, and spent a lot of time thinking about what happened to him, his family, and his son, Philip, um, during that traumatic period. And this painting was a result. And a lot of you will look at this and think, well, this is a bit anachronistic. We've got the doctor with their beard, wistfully looking at the child. We've got the child prostate on the bed. We've got a, a figure who is the child's father hidden away. Um, and maybe this is a, a view of medicine that we don't recognize. And there are lots of things that we have done recently, I think, in medicine. And by recently, I mean the last decade to improve care. So if we look at the way that we involve children, both in patient-centered communication, but also in research, in a way that just hasn't happened in the last 10, 15 years, that we are really understanding how we engage with parents. And sadly, we are marred by, or tarnished, I suppose, with some interaction with parents where maybe they're not acting as their child's advocate, but actually 99% of the time they do. And when they say, I think my child is ill and getting worse, we should take that on board. And I think we are all beginning to realize and acknowledge that. And most recently, we're looking at ourselves. So the concepts of well-being, burnout, etc., are terms that are new as well. So we have these three facets in this painting. There's one thing that is missing, and that is treatments themselves. And I'm going to suggest over the next 10, 15 minutes or so, that actually treatments are the missing paradigm of how we can improve care for children. And it's probably treatments that we don't agree on, or actually in pediatric emergency medicine, do we need to be doing anything at all? And when I started as chair of Peruki a couple of years ago, I had this vision that I was going to be standing up at conferences talking about novel, groundbreaking research. I would be talking about technologies, and we'd invented a new wonder drug, and we would be saving lives. What I've realized over the last couple of years is that is not the problem. The problem is me, and it's you, because we don't appreciate or understand evidence well enough, and we all differ in what we do. And you've heard a bit of that, of the evidence for that, and I'd like to explore that a bit further. Peruki are a new organization. So Meredith was talking about um, Predict existing in 2004. Peruki came to existence in 2012. Um, it's a pretty motley crew to begin with, if I'm honest. And I would like to pay particular or, or shout out to Mark Little, who really drove forward Peruki in, in the early stages um, and has been uh, an expert collabor collaborator and visionary in, in pulling people together and making Peruki the thing that it is today. And what we did first was we set some priorities. We decided amongst uh, the members of Peruki that we would do a Delphi exercise. So what that is, is everyone just put in, this is the research that I would like to do. We had a massive list of research options, and then those same people went back through that list, and we highlighted uh, the research which we thought was the most important and went through a couple of iterations and essentially came up with a top 20 which we published. And number four on that list is what is the best intravenous medication for asthma? Um, and this is something that has been mystifying clinicians around the world uh, for a while uh, because there is a flavor of the month, sometimes salbutamol, sometimes aminophilin, depends, pick your month, uh, toss your coin. And just to say that this isn't pediatric emergency medicine research biased, in that particular 
um, study. So what we did is we went out to all the Pruki sites and we asked members at those sites to distribute the survey. And we got a good mix of general pediatricians, PEM clinicians, emergency medicine clinicians, emergency medicine clinicians with a pediatric background. So it was a, a nice getting together of 180 people. Um, and you can use the QR code to go straight to the paper. And what we found was, is that when you looked at what people were using for their rates of treatment, there was a tenfold variation. So that uh, there was a difference between using 0.1 to 1 microgram per kilogram per minute of something way up to, to six. And we all use a normal range, but there were some institutions that always started high, some started low. Now, I'm not saying that we all need to do the same thing. In fact, that would be pointless. We know the child in front of us, especially with wheeze, has different phenotypes, different genotypes. But a tenfold variation is pretty massive. And we asked people in that survey, what is your preferred treatment? You've got a child with severe asthma, they need intravenous therapy, what are you going to use? And they said, well, most people will use salbutamol. Then, I, then a, a fewer people, 25% said magnesium sulfate, and around less than 15 said aminophilin. And then some people said they use a, a combination. So we then did a survey, of th a, a, a review of 3,000 patients uh, at exactly the same time that we sent this survey out in March 2013, and people lied, okay? Everyone gave magnesium. Mm -hmm. So they may have said, actually, I'm going to follow the guidelines, but what I really do in my practice is give magnesium, okay? So there's both variation in practice in the real world, and there's variation in what you say you do in the real world. So we've got double jeopardy. And then, just as a, a little niche extra question, so I just want to stick your hand up. If you have a child who is on an intravenous medication, do you continue to give them inhaled treatment? So put your hand up if you do continue to give inhaled treatment if you've got an IV. Okay. So I think that's probably around 80%. And look at that. So that is, the, the survey said 80% continue nebulized as well on intravenous treatment. Now, does it matter that 20% aren't? Uh, or does it matter that 80% are doing something that they don't need to do? I don't know, but that is a difference. And considering the enormity of patients who present to emergency departments and assessment units around the world, that extra 20% actually turns out to be a large amount of patients. And this is research that took back in, in 2013 and 14. And I feel really guilty. When I was preparing this talk, I realized I had done absolutely diddly squat about this problem. So we know about the problem, but we're not really moving the field on. And thankfully, Simon Craig, who's uh, in Australia, is doing a large outcomes study of asthma. The problem with asthma research is that we can't really agree on what the benefits are. So how can you do a randomized controlled trial if we can't agree on actually what the benefit is looking at? So that's what I, we're, over the next couple of years, an international group are going to develop some outcomes using parents and clinicians and patients to define those. The next thing that uh, came across is that um, we've already had presented about the variation in practice for bronchiolitis. And I took a bit of a gamble um, that Stuart would highlight that piece of, of work. Um, and it's nice that he highlighted that piece of work, um, because when you look at variation in chest x-rays, for example, um, and who does an unnecessary chest x-ray um, in bronchiolitis, Pruki performed pretty well compared to our uh, other network providers. Now, when I show this um, to uh, the, the other networks, they say, well, Damien, look at the length of the lines. Um, and what the lines are are confidence intervals. They're a, a measure of precision, and they do just about overlap. So it is possible that by chance alone, in thousands of children that this study was done, that Peruki may have been bottom just by chance. Just. But I, I will, I'll let you kind of dwell uh, on where you think we sit. So, but after that study, we got together with a Canadian group who are a bit worried about their, um, the, the amount of medications or investigations they're doing. And we just said a really simple question. You've got a child, 
three days of upper respiratory tract infection with no other risk factors. On the sheet of paper we gave them, we gave some clear observations. Just note that the temperature is 38.1 degrees in this four-week-old. And we asked the group, OK, this is likely to be bronchiolitis, but what are you going to do? And we compared the two groups between uh, clinicians in Canada and clinicians in the UK. And I have borrowed this slide from yesterday's PEM Adventure Talks because I think it demonstrates really well huge variation in practice. This isn't just a marginal thing. This is a difference of an LP rate of 10% in the UK up to 60% in Canada. Why is that? I, I'm not sure. I can postulate, but if that, that variation exists on an international scale, I'm pretty sure it exists on a national scale. Um, and I, I am infused and I am passionate about trying to work out why that is. So that's a bit about variation in practice. What about treatments that are efficacious or treatments that work? So the Eclipse study was a study of levoceteracam, a newer anti-epileptic, versus phenytoin in the treatment of status epilepticus. Now, please read that study. Go to the Don't Forget the Bubbles website. There's a blog about it, and you can link directly to the open access paper. That study is important because it will help our management of status. But it's probably more important for getting people to understand superiority and non-inferiority. Um, now, lots of people come up to me and say, oh, we're going to leave the research to Damien. There's an assistant prof or prof over there. There's lots of tribalism uh, in, in medicine at the moment. I think there is research tribalism. It shouldn't be left to me. Research and statistics aren't that complicated. They need to be explained in a way that engages people. Um, and what I'd like to happen is rather than people go, statistics meh, you don't go, actually, it's quite complicated looking after a three-day-old with congenital heart disease that you have to get up dinoprostin for. No one goes, I can't do that, it's too complicated. So why do we do it about research and statistics? So these are a group of patients that happened to come through our door who were recruited into the Eclipse trial. Before the study, we thought that phenytoin had a 60% success rate at terminating children who have status epilepticus. We thought before the study that levoceterosam had a 75% success rate. So what the statisticians did was work out what will make that different. So the aim of the, the game was to say, if we recruit to two arms, and we recruit to some patients to levoceterosam and some patients to phenytoin. If we have 200 patients in each group, if there is this difference, if there is a 15% difference, we know that that is a true difference. That's not just going to happen because it was the day of the week or, again, random chance. That, fifth, that if we get 200 patients in both arms, that difference will be true. Now, imagine if you only had a 1% difference. By chance alone, that could happen. So you're going to need hundreds and hundreds of patients uh, to do that. But fortunately, there was a 15% difference. Actually, what happened is for phenytoin, um, rather than it being uh, 60%, it was 65% in Eclipse. Rather than levoceterosam performing at 75%, it actually only performed at 70%. So there wasn't that 15% difference. So we can't say that levoceterosam is superior to phenytoin. Okay. Lots of people interpreted that as, well, if it's not better, it must be the same. But actually, that's not the question that was asked. If you want to show that something is non-inferior or no worse than, you have to do a different calculation. And by consensus, the difference is probably needs to be no more than 10%. Now, in, if we'd done this for, in the Eclipse study, actually, it probably would have been in those margins, and they would have been equivalent. I make the point about 10%, because in concept, which I think may be discussed tomorrow um, by the PREDIC group, the levoceterosam was 10%, according to the numbers, worse than, than Kepra. And so we don't know, actually, if levoceterosam is equal, so that there is equipoise. 
Right? And that is a challenge that, that we face. Just some other things that came out of the eclipse study. 10% of first day febrile convulsions required second line treatment. Okay? So children who come in, 10% of them, actually it's the first time they've had a seizure, and a lot of them end up um, needing phenytoin or Kepa, which was a higher number than I realized. And 5% of patients had intracranial infection. Think meningitis when you're dealing with status. And finally, just in terms of doing the variability point, the median, not the mean, not the average, but the median time to start the infusion between the two groups was broadly similar. The time for seizure cessation was nearly 20 minutes later. Okay. Now, levoceterosam only takes five minutes to run, but the median time was 20 minutes. You need to think about how long it actually takes some of these drugs to work in our practice. And that's why sometimes there is tension between clinical groups. Because we know that we've been managing the fitting patient in front of us in the ED, but the intensive care team who may have a, a, a crammed unit are always going to want to wait that extra minute. Now onto something different. This is a, a buckle fracture. We're running a, a, a study at the moment called FORCE where we're, rather than putting a child into a splint, we are putting them in, randomized to a splint or a bandage, literally a bandage wrapped around the wrist. We wanted to do nothing, but actually parents and children said, we won't tolerate nothing, we'd like a bandage instead. Uh, so we're offering a bandage. The study that is going to come up next year is called CRAFT. Now, before this study started, I would have looked at this x-ray and said, this needs something doing to it. Okay. If you do nothing to this, it will eventually remodel. If you take this child, it's completely off end at his radius, and you do nothing to it, it will remodel. So we're going to do a randomized controlled trial of essentially nothing of off ended radiuses versus. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think as well. <laughs> I just don't say it publicly. Mm -hmm. And then just something we've got going is an evaluation of the incidence of croup in the UK. I think croup is a, um, a, a modal or model condition because we tend to get the diagnosis right. Wheeze could be asthma, could be bronchiolitis. Croup is croup. So we're looking at the, the time of uh, croup admissions and diagnosis over time to see how patterns of illness are changing. What I found out was that if you look at giving steroids to children with croup, um, about... Uh, 11 to 15% uh, of them will ret return if, um, with, with croup. If you give placebo, only 20% of them come back. So 80% of children who you give nothing to in croup uh, will not come back to your hospital. Just worth dwelling on that. You actually need to treat 11 patients with croup to actually have any meaningful gain in return rates. This was a quote at a recent conference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the best quote anyone has ever said about myself or an organization. I think that person is in this audience. I'm not going to name them, uh, but I love you. This is awesome. Okay? We don't seem too clever. Get involved. Research is not difficult. So please be part of the missing conundrum. Yes, take care of yourself. Yes, take care of your patients. Make sure you involve parents. But think about the treatments you are giving and think about the variation that you may be putting both on your individual practice or your departments. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I think you're all very clever. Um, but I also think you're all very supportive and completely generous with your, um, the time and energy that you put into promoting others in research. And so I would reiterate the message slightly differently because I think they're clever, that every, anyone who's interested um, should get involved. I think we've got some questions from Twitter. Thanks. We've got loads of questions. We've uh, got loads of time. It, it so seems like you've going. all finally woken up. Uh, so uh, first one from Michael McCarran. Uh, as a trainee, exposure to education and research is variable. 
Um, if you do want clinicians to participate in research, what's Peruki doing to incorporate training and time for training in research into clinical training? Ooh, murmur from the audience. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, so that, it's a really good question. So there's a, a couple of things that I think I can say are, are definitely positive. I hope those of you who had a chance uh, to see Mario and Tom talk yesterday about the study they've been involved in. Uh, Peruki have done their best to support those trainee-led type studies. I think they have been successful, and I think the enthusiasm that Mariel and Tom is, is infectious, and I hope other people become part of that. And there are lots of smaller studies in Peruki that trainees can get involved in. I, time is difficult, uh, and that I, I, have, uh, I am more uncomfortable about because I know that at any given time, with gaps on rotors, with the pressures of work, it is difficult to find meaningful time, especially for junior doctors, but I think exactly the same applies to consultants and exactly the same applies to nurses um, to, to, to get involved and, and do stuff. And one of the things that the colleges, uh, especially in the UK, are going to be working harder at is as part of the curriculum is to mandate opportunities for research. So it's not good enough just to say, well, we're going to give you time to do clinical work. Actually, I think research and improvement and implementation are so fundamentally important that it's not a nice to do, it is a must have. And Peruki are involved, especially with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine and the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health to have that embedded in cur curricula, not just as a word, but actually as part of your week. I think everyone should be allowed to do an UP, uh, or, uh, that's a, a year out, to do research, if, regardless of what the outcome of that year is. Um, and also, we should also have time within each um, working week to, to have protected time to do things. Can I, can I yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in Predict, we've also been talking about this dilemma that we have with allowing our trainees to get involved in our studies, it's very difficult because over the time I've been doing research, the processes to do a research project have got so much more complicated. Um, in my research fellowship year that I did, I did three studies. Um, I completed a, one randomised controlled study and started another one. It, because you could get ethics quickly and, I don't know, the processes have got better. But it is actually incredibly hard for trainees who actually have a relatively small amount of time to actually undertake a, a, a um, study. And so what they tend to do is actually systematic reviews or meta-analyses or things like that that probably aren't quite as interesting or are actually um, prospective. We haven't got an answer to that yet and our colleges... Um, haven't necessarily even gone as far as actually suggesting that people could have time out to do research projects. So I think it's a wait and see, but we are advocating to try and get trainees in, into our research projects. Certainly in general paediatrics in Australia, um, all of the trainees have to do a research project. That doesn't necessarily mean they have the time to do it, but they have to do it as part of their training, um, you know, as, yeah, on top of their clinical work. I strongly encourage all the trainees to do some research that's fun. Um, yes, the biggest difficulty is just the planning of it, mm. that the trouble is if you only started at the start of that year. And particularly to fight for that last year before you go into practice, that you do some research that year. Because yeah. that'll keep going with you, it'll follow you, it'll be great for your CV, it'll help you get jobs, etc. And not only get involved in the community. Mm. Yeah. So another question, um, Chris White would like to ask you, Damien. Um, considering the variation uh, in practice that you showed uh, in your talk, does that mean that we have to be a little bit wary of what we see in FOMED uh, so, uh, from various places and, and how applicable that is to our own practice? Yeah, that, um, so thank you. I, I spend um, not an inconsiderable amount of time on social media. Um, to to those, who, uh, those who challenge me that I spend too much, uh, you can only know I'm spending too much time on it if you're on it as well. Um, so that's my stock defense. Um, my, my personal view is that, that there is a, a common <coughs> criticism that 
the, the social media digital networks encourage people to try new things without reading the, the evidence and just implement into practice. I, I see little evidence of that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, and I'm not saying that errors have been made. But if it was the case that especially social media or FOMED had such a powerful impact and people just did things because other people said them, we wouldn't have the implementation challenges that we have. Mm -hmm. It can't possibly be the case that we're saying it's aged. We can't change anything, but suddenly we have this medium that allows you to change. Those two things are uneasy bedfellows uh, in, in, in my mind. Um, and so the, uh, the narratives or the discussions that I get involved in are about regressing to the mean. So you do see discussions flare up. Uh, don't forget the Bubbles Journal Club. It's a really good example of where we'll take a paper, and the paper often gets sidetracked by people's personal practice. But that's in a way, there's lots of people giving different opinions, but we're bringing it back to the patient and what we do. And it's a way of observing that variation and discussing it and getting it out there. And I think that is a bigger benefit. I am not saying, again, that there aren't a few negatives. There are. But the benefits of having these open discussions about why we do different practice and why there are differences of opinion about research works can only be for the better in the long term. And the more we have those discussions, the less variability there will be. Mm. Okay. I um, can I say something? I think, you know, when you talk about mindlessly following what, you know, what someone says on social media, I think, you know, how many people have just read the abstract of an article without accessing the full article? Mm. You know, I don't think it's, um, I actually think it's considerably better than doing that because at least on social media, as Damien just said, you know, you have lots of people discussing the pros and cons and debating, um, a little bit like how Wikipedia is actually quite accurate when compared with Encyclopedia Britannica because there is so much discussion and updating that it, regresses or progresses towards accuracy. I think social media, um, when used for foam med, particularly the more people involved, the better. I, I think it's not dissimilar. Um, and we want to know, are there any plans to do a meta-analysis of Eclipse and Concept? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> what more do you want to say? <laughs> yes, the answer. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, any more from... Uh, yes, uh, and again, coming back to the issue of disparity, um, it, but more in terms of uh, practice rather than foment, people are asking about with that international variation, is that necessarily a bad thing? Or is it, you know, so the implication that somewhere is doing too much, you know, or, or is it the case perhaps that a variation in practice is a perfectly acceptable thing within medicine? Yeah, so, so, so that's excellent. So for me, the, the important thing is that people note it. Um, I would like you to be as excited about it as I am, because if we're all excited about it, we're all going to start exploring and doing something uh, about it. I, I think uh, that is a good challenge. If we look at head injury guidelines, for example, this is a, a good example, it's likely the North Americans were doing too many CT scans. By the same token, it's likely in the UK we were doing too few at one stage, uh, because we couldn't get access to, to CT scans, and we were just going completely with Gestalt, which isn't a bad thing. Um, but the, because that variation was so highlighted, and as I think the, especially the, the Predict guys have been doing, is what does happen if you implement something at scale? And they were quite clear. If you are doing too many CT scans, this guideline will help you. But there is a real problem that it might start causing you to do unnecessary t CT scans as well. So that, that variation isn't necessarily wrong, but it may impact on patient care, and so we need to explore that. I, the other thing is, is it, it could well be that we are uh, under-managing a number of our bronchiolytic patients uh, in the UK. Um, having said that, it would be very difficult for Peruki to convince people to join the adrenaline and dexamethasone study because I think people would just not buy into that at all, and you need academic equipoise to be able to move forward with research studies. Um, and then finally, Ian Summers is asking, at what stage, if at all, do you or should you involve patients and families in the generation of research questions and clinical outcomes that matter to them? 
Yep, so um, Peruki have done this really badly. Uh, so I, I'll just be honest about that. Uh, we have yet to have a permanent uh, kind of child or young person representative as, as part of our, our group. And the challenge is, is unlike chronic conditions, children come in and out of emergency practice quite quickly and, and garnishing someone who hasn't had their experiences biased or contaminated by their, their chronic condition is difficult. So, so there is a challenge, but I think it needs to happen. Precisely for the, the four studies, a really good example. Um, at the very beginning, Dan Perry, who is a, a, an awesome kind of pediatric orthopedic researcher, went straight to families and children and asked them what they thought and asked them what they thought that they could consent to in a, in a study. And it was quite clear at this stage they wouldn't be able to deal with nothing. Now, it may be after force, it will then be a bandage versus nothing, but that it would have been a leap too far. The other fascinating thing about the craft study that he's running, so that's of these kind of off-ended radiuses, is that we went, <gasps> like, that's not going to happen. If you go to a family and say, okay, there is evidence that this will heal by itself, and healing by itself means your child doesn't need to go to theatre. Okay? Actually, parents and young people, they don't want to go to theatre. That is an immensely stressful experience, which we completely underplay. Every day, we will see a child and say, oh, you need to see the orthopods, we're going to have to fix that in theatre, as if it's the most normal thing in the world. Okay? I'm not saying I say it like that, but it, that is sometimes the impression that can come across. Whereas if you're a family, actually, it is a big deal. Um, and so working with people early on in the studies will get you to some of the conclusions that are meaningful for patients themselves. Can I again add something? Um, for anyone who missed Kerry Wolfel's talk yesterday, when it's available um, on the Don't Forget the Bubbles website and Facebook and Twitter, um, I'd really encourage you all to watch it. It was absolute, an absolutely excellent discussion on using uh, families and children to influence not so much the question asking, but the design and conduct of, um, of the research that we do and actually changing trials as you go along to incorporate the feedback from families. Um, which complements that question as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, got a question. This work. yeah, it works. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, can I ask a question about uh, the two trials we focused on? That's been bugging me for a while. So we, you've explained beautifully the, uh, how to interpret non-inferiority studies, and I know that wasn't the design from the outset. But if Kepra is on balance, non-inferior to phenytoin. And we know that Kepra's side effect profile is less than that of phenytoin, and it can be given faster. And I'm sure I'm not the only inpatient clinician that wants the fit to stop faster in this room, uh, uh, surrounded by emergency physicians. Should, it, should we not, at the very least, consider having it next to phenytoin as an option on our APLS status of left to algorithm? So I, I can probably answer that a little bit. So we've changed our guidelines in Australia and New Zealand to deal with that. So the CONCEPT study showed that there was no difference between the two. The ECLIPSE study showed that there was no difference between the two. One study was slightly towards levetiracetam, one study was slightly towards phenytoin. And so what we're left with is we're going to do a meta-analysis, but there's a US trial which is on the way. So we've made the decision to change our guidelines so it's benzo benzo, then levetiracetam, because that will mean half the patients don't need to have phenytoin and all the problems that you're alluding to from that point of view. And then you have to have phenytoin if you're still fitting. The other problem with management of status is we're really bad at actually intubating the patients on time when um, we need to as well. So the nice thing about doing it in that order is you've got 20 minutes where you're giving a phenytoin infusion where you then need to tell the team to do something. And that's something for that team to do is to prepare for intubation. And I think by using that order that actually deals with a number of pragmatic and practical problems, which you're never going to quite get in a randomised control trial. And it's sort of taking the evidence 
and then translating it into real world um, clinical practice. And that's how um, the Royal Children's Hospital guidelines have changed too, Starship guidelines have changed too, and APLS New Zealand have changed their teaching of that as well. So, you, so you've, you're changing the guideline for Kepra 20 minutes, is that correct? How so, so it's benzodiazepine, benzodiazepine, and then the first drug you give is Kepra. So these guys did something really clever, and they, one, because they are clever, but two, because they have been a lot around a lot longer than we have in Peruki, is that they've started to write guidelines and have embedded themselves in the national processes in Australia and New Zealand. We're not at that stage in Peruki. My vision for the future is that we can do these type of studies, go to the major organizations that deal with guidelines in the UK, and say, actually, look at this evidence now. Um, I don't think we've got the weight of credibility behind us to start doing that, and I think there will be an unfortunate delay for NICE and APLS UK to look at this question and, and, and get it back. What people do on the ground now it is, a, it is an interesting debate, um, and it is interesting having those of us who were part of the Eclipse study. Levisotera Sam is very easy to draw up. Uh, no one saw any real adverse profiles, um, and my experience with the nursing staff is they were quite confident in using it by the end of the study. So there is an open house when we get the green light. All right. Thank you to everyone. I think that's time now. Um, thanks particularly to Meredith, Damien, Stewart and Edward on the Twitter moderation.